Hello, good afternoon. I am John Washington, very happy to be here with Harsha Walia and Todd Miller. We are going to be discussing uh, border and immigration politics. We're going to be imagining what a world without borders might look like. And uh, we're going to be basing a lot of that conversation on their two new scintillating, readable, and profoundly important books. I have them both right here. We have Harsha's Border and Rule and Todd Miller's Build Bridges and Not Walls. And uh, I'm going to um, lay out briefly what we're going to be doing today, just you know, introducing myself and Harsha and Todd briefly right here. I'm going to be reading a couple of quotes to frame this conversation, and then we're just going to jump in and, and hear from Harsha and Todd um, about how they're thinking about current border and immigration policy and how we move beyond uh, current practices and policies. Um, so I'm John Washington, and I'm a journalist and translator and activist myself. I write mostly for The Nation and The Intercept. Uh, my first book, The Dispossessed, was out last year. Uh, it was about asylum and history of asylum and people who are currently seeking asylum. Um, I'm also an editor at El Faro English, which is a English language offshoot of a Salvadoran based investigative news outlet. And we publish a bi weekly newsletter. Um, you know, you can find my work if you so please uh, on the internet. And um, I am happy to, so happy to be here talking to Harsha and Todd. So, Harsha is a scholar a activist, a writer, and I would say, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, probably one of the most important thinkers on borders and immigration in the world. Her two books are uh, Undoing Border Imperialism, which is a book that takes on and interrogates ideas around activism and how people engage with trying to change the system. Um, and also kind of resets and, and rethinks the big picture framing of, of how we look at border politics in this, as the title suggests, um, imperial lens. And uh, her new book is Border and Rule, which is out just a couple months ago. And it is really a very wide ranging, I would say breathtaking, just expose and exploration into a whole range of issues about border and immigration politics. And, and one of the things that I think it does so well and is so important, the work that, that she does there is, is sort of unpacks how tightly imbricated these policies are with racism, with classism, with misogyny, and after this like devastating blow to the current system, this devastating critique to the current system, looks beyond it and, and makes a, a very um, compelling argument for m moving towards a world with no borders. So, Arsha, so, so glad to be in conversation with you again. Uh, Todd Miller, um, an old friend of mine who is probably the most persistent and maybe the most painful thorn in the side of the United States Border Patrol. Um, he really was a trailblazer in coverage of DHS and coverage more specifically of, of Border Patrol with his first book, Border Patrol Nation, um, which has been you know, an inspiration to, to so many uh, journalists and scholars. He followed that with, um, I, I hope I get the order right, with um, Storming the Wall which is about how border issues are going to be and are becoming ever more important um, as climate change pushes more people from their homes. Um, and then Empire of Borders, which takes on how the U.S. Border Patrol and DHS uh, more broadly is pushing or exporting their policies of strict anti-migrant um, border enforcement into the rest of the world, um, not only in you know this hemisphere, but um, really all over the world, and training other countries to um, follow suit. And then most recently, um, build bridges, not walls, which is his most personal account, and it sort of takes on um, his 
relationship to that coverage, which I've just been describing, and makes this, um, much like Harsha's book, um, makes this really impassioned plea for, um, for opening borders. So, Todd, likewise, just so happy to be in conversation with you again. Um, and I want to start, um, as I said, with um, framing this conversation with a couple quotes from two very different people. So the first quote is from Kamala Harris, who has... Um, some of you know, probably many of you know, was very recently in Guatemala as sort of something like um, the charge d'affaires or the special envoy of the Biden administration to care of migration from the region. And she said, and this, this got a lot, quite a lot of play, but I think it's, it's worth revisiting. Quote, I want to be clear to folks in the region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The United States will continue to enforce our laws and secure our border. There are legal methods by which legal migration can and should occur. But we will discourage illegal migration. The goal of our work is to help Guatemalans find hope at home. So the second quote is from Hannah Arendt. And she was writing um, in the middle of the 20th century, and she was addressing the very intense um, decades previous numbers of people who were forcibly displaced, um, mostly around the two world wars, but also around some other you know, geopolitical conflicts. And she wrote that, quote, what was unprecedented was not the loss of a home, but the impossibility of finding a new one. I think that's um, a really interesting observation that she makes, and I think it certainly held true at that moment. You know, she, her, her point here is that for all of human history, people have lost their homes for one reason or another. You know, uh, natural disasters, because of political violence, because of all sorts of reasons, people were driven out of their homes but what we saw, and this was sort of the culmination of a few centuries of changing policies, what we saw in the beginning of the 20th century was a new way of blocking people, new efforts around the world of trying to stop human mobility, of trying to combat human mobility. And I, I purposely use the martial language there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, what, what that ended up in, um, what ended up occurring was was these huge disasters of people who were homeless, who were stateless, who were refugees, who could not find uh, a place for themselves in society. And as I said, well, I think that observation was very, uh, you know, very cogent at the moment. I don't think it really applies to our current day. And that's because right now we are seeing in a different way more than ever before in history, more and more people lose their homes. So the second half of that quote is still very much holds true, that the impossibility for many people of finding new homes is still very real. But what we're seeing, both in sheer numbers as a percentage of the total human population, and in large part because of the current and, and you know incoming climate crises, but also because of ongoing political crises because of ongoing neoliberal or post-colonial extraction and uh, exploitation, we're seeing more and more people driven out of their homes. So we have these sort of concomitant disasters and crises of people who are forced to flee and have nowhere to flee to. And I start with these two things because, well, I think um, they put the importance of this, con uh, importance of this conversation into light. Um, but I think what I'd like to just underscore here is the absolute urgency of what we are facing and that it is going to become even more urgent. So we have a couple of ways that we can respond to it. We can respond, you know, as people of the world with trying to build taller, thicker, or more technologically advanced walls. We can continue to try to deport people who somehow skirt those walls. We can continue to, to try to enforce this regime of global apartheid. Or, and I hope we spend a lot of time on this part of a possible answer, 
we can try to find ways to build sustainable homes, to welcome people who are forced to flee their homes, and we can try to dismantle that regime that is causing these crises. These crises. Um, so <clears throat> I want to start with a simple question to both Harsha and Todd. Um, and, and this might sound a little bit like I'm putting the cart before the horse, but I think there's so it's so easy to get caught up in, you know, listing this in, this in incredibly long litany of just absolute horrors around what is happening at borders and in immigration enforcement throughout the world. And then it's complicated and there's so many different ways to tackle the, the conversation, the argument for open borders that I think sometimes people don't get to this question is, do you believe open borders are possible? Um, and, you know, so sometimes I think people can think it's a thought exercise or it's a, it's a political and so I'd, I'd like to ask that, that simple question to you all um, and, and, and just hear you sort of address it or, or you know, any of the, the, my sort of uh, opening remarks. But maybe we can start with you, Harsha. Boy, <laughs> just that, that uh, incredible introduction and that expansive question. Thank you, John. Um, let me just start by saying uh, how excited um, and just delighted I am to be in conversation with both of you. Both of your work is just so central to our movements to dismantle borders, not to reform, but to dismantle them um, and to really bring these, these struggles um, alive and to imbue them with the, the meaning and the humanity that they deserve. Um, and dispossessed and empire of borders and to build bridges, not walls, just all of them are some of my favorite books. And so thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. But I'd have to say, um, we're all thinking alongside and, and my work exists alongside all of yours and so many others. So thank you both. Um, I'm also on the lands of the Coast Salish people. I'm on the lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squahomish nations. And these are indigenous nations who have never ceded or surrendered their land, their nationhood um, or their, uh, their laws or their jurisdiction on these territories. And I think in thinking through a no border politics um, and that question of whether uh, open borders um, is is a possibility. You know, for me, one of those windows of prefiguration, of decolonization, of abolition, is the reaffirmation of indigenous nationhood. Right to think about what it means to live on these lands, these occupied, stolen lands, in a way that affirms not the settler colonial state, but that affirms kinship uh, to and with indigenous nations and all peoples on these lands in a different way. So. Um, I offer that not simply as an acknowledgement, but also, I think, a window uh, to an answer to that question of what's possible, because Indigenous nationhood looks different, and I don't want to assume that it looks like one thing, um, but the nations that I've had the honor of visiting with and being in relationship with have offered um, a way of thinking about presence um, and accountability to the land and to each other that absolutely transcends the carceral state that transcends carceral borders. So yes, I think it's possible. And I think many people are living that reality and affirming those ways of being all the time. Um, and part of our, our role is to, to see those and uplift those realities. Um, I won't go into the litany <laughs> then since you, <laughs> you, um, you warned us against that and I, and I appreciate that. Maybe what I will start by saying, and we can return to this because I do think those two quotes that you offered, um, I did have some thoughts on, but I won't start with that and we can return to it perhaps, is um, for me actually, I think there is a difference between an open border politics and a no border politics. Um, and this may seem like a thought exercise or semantics, um, but for me, an open border politics as it's commonly understood is you know one where the world remains as it is and we open the borders, right? Like where people move. Um, and then that, that tends to the question of open the borders, you know, there's gonna be a border rush or what about a brain drain? Um, or, you know, it, it basically assumes the world will remain as is in all other ways. And that really the global north continues to exist as the global north, which only exists in relationship to the global south, right? The global north and the global south are not geographies. They're political conditions that are contingent on each other. Um, so for me, an open border politics 
is one that assumes the world remains as is. And we open up the borders in a gesture of, you know, welcome generosity in this moment of climate catastrophe um, and other multiplying crises. But fundamentally, these structures remain the same. Um, whereas what I'm in, interested in um, and hoping to intervene on with, you know, with many others alongside, of course, the both of you as well, uh, is a no border politics. And for me, a no border politics is different because it calls on us to fundamentally reimagine the world. It calls on us to understand that borders are at the nexus of many sites of violence, right? At the site of state formation, of racial capitalism, racial citizenship. And it's not just the border at the site of the border. It's not just the performance of the border at the site of the border, but it's, lo it's looking at dismantling bordering regimes wherever and however they multiply and exist. Um, which means that we fight for an end to drone warfare, right? That we're fighting for an end to sweatshops. We're fighting for an end to extractive trade agreements. We're fighting for an end to climate catastrophe catastrophes. We're fighting for an end to sweatshops, to prisons, uh, to, to police. Like all of that is part of the reimagining of a no border politics. And within a no border politics, uh, the freedom and the right to to move are as important as the right to remain, right? That no one is forcibly displaced from their lands, which comes back to those earlier comments. Um, and that people have the right to move, right? So that the right to remain and the right to move are not contradictions, but are corollaries um, to the idea of home. And to me, that that is the no border politics um, that I believe in, that I think is central to revolutionary struggle, that is central to anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-imperialist struggle, and that I absolutely believe is possible. Like that is the nature of struggle, right? The nature of, the, of struggle is to politically imagine and believe that we can build another world and that in fact it's being built. Um, and here I would end with perhaps the words of Mariam Kaba who reminds us that hope is a discipline, right? Um, so we have to believe that another reality is, is being built because the current reality is beyond dystopian, right? We cannot accept reform or the present. Um, and we have to vehemently believe um, in a world without borders, with no borders, and that exists uh, alongside dismantling all forms of state and capitalist violence. Thank, thanks so much, Harsha. Todd, can I pose the, the same question to you? Uh, yeah, thank thank you, Harsha. That that was uh, as always very incisive and inspiring. How you answered that question, um, and like you, I'm just very inspired to be here with you and and you, John, as well. And uh, and you know, border and rule and undoing border imperialism. Those are two really key books for me. And um, just the way to, and is border and rule just the way that it? Uh, I think it's perhaps the most important book that I've read on on the border apparatus, the global border apparatus, um, in in all in all the ways that John's John mentioned. Um so thank you. Gratitude. And John, uh it's just very nice to be in conversation with you and and also your work and the dispossessed is uh, one of the best works of reportage that I've I've read. Um and so it's just an honor to be here with you. And like Harcha, I'm I'm um like I'm I'm uh, talking from 100 triple digit temperatures um, in uh, southern Arizona, Tucson, which is uh, Ton Autumn land. Um, that, and of course, when thinking again about the question and thinking about how the border was an imposition, a violent imposition here, um, it, uh, it cleaved through the 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 the, the, the lands of the Ton Autumn. So, uh, you know, people live on both sides. Right now, after the border was imposed, I say imposed because the Ton Autumn were not consulted. Like, at, just like almost anywhere where you see these sorts of borders, uh, the people that, the indigenous people are very rarely consulted and it's almost always imposed. And that and that's definitely the case here. So so as, as, as we look towards uh, this kind of no border, a no border, um, goal and maybe open borders is a is a step <laughs> a step to that goal i'm not sure um but uh that that i mean i i definitely you know underscore that you know this 
that like if one of the things I look at, one of the things I think of is I look at I have a map here over to my left and um it's color coded and uh it it's you look at the map and it's it's more like designated in the shapes of na- these nation states, right? You look at the continent of Africa and it's just divided into these really peculiar straight lines and you think well, how you know, like, how were these things? Wh- why did they come about? When when did this happen? And and almost always, you're going to have a colonial process of subjugation, as Harsha so aptly describes in Border and Rule. And um and like the in Africa in 18, the 1883 Berlin Conference is what car- decided you know decided where the borders are that that we consider almost sac- sacrosanct, right? You can't question them. Or the 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 um the 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 border that goes through the U.S. Southwest with the Gadsden Purchase, which is a purchase, is a misnomer. It should be called like at the point of a gun, right? Uh, and 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 you think you know that's this this was imposed, but yet we're not allowed to question this this border. We're not allowed to say like this. We should think about this. So I I, I totally I really appreciate your your question. Um, to open this up to really begin to get the imagination fired up. And just in terms of like open, like thinking of open borders, um, not no borders yet, but open borders maybe as a step. The fo- it's a really a remarkable thing that, that that term just has become so stigmatized in so many ways. Like, oh, open borders, you know, you, <laughs> you're, it's either, oh, you mentioned that, well, you're going to be ridiculed for that or, or, uh, oh, you're just not logical. I can't, you know, that there's that sort of, and I say that because since Bill Bridges, Not Walls came out, I do get that question. I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, and, uh, and you know, you when you look for examples of open borders, like what, like somebody, like I've had questions, who, what is an example of an open border? And I, and I, and I started thinking, I'm like, well, how about you know, between the states and the United States, right? <laughs> like, remember, remember at the beginning of the of the Corona, uh, the COVID in March, when Rhode Island, remember when Rhode Island um, said it was going to track all New York state license plates that came across that border, and um, Andrew Cuomo freaked out. He said, "No, you can't do that. You're we're going to, we're going to sue you. It's illegal, right?" And and that was that was it, right? That's that's um, all of a sudden a border regime is imposed upon people in New York state. Right. And then, but, but from that context is like the, the idea of an open border being ridiculous is, is far, you know, it's more ridiculous actually when you think of it that way to think of a closed border. And, um, and that's, and, and uh, I think Cuomo illustrated that. And then the other thing I just want to bring up, cause I think Harsha really underscored what a lot of what I, I think is correct about open border or no, no borders. And, and I'll leave her, I'll leave it, you know, I'll just piggyback off those words. But um, another thing when the word, when the term open borders is mentioned, it's almost always like people arriving to, to the border. Right. And it's never like corporate power. Like if you look at um, all these agreements, uh, like just say the North American free trade agreement, Free trade agreement, another misnomer, right? It's actually an open borders agreement for corporate power, and um, it was written by 500 corporations. There was no consultation of anyone besides that, and there was there was no civil civil society, no, you know, there was just so when this idea of open borders, there is open borders. There are agreements for open borders. There are no border patrols for like you know, the transnational corporations that, that just go wherever they please, take whatever they want, wreak de- destruction in so many places. Or the mili- like the U.S. military has 800 military bases around the world. It can just go wherever it wants and drop bombs. And the havoc and the destruction that is wrought by by this this open border, you know, this, this policy of open borders um, for corporations, military, the elite, the governments associated with them is never brought up in these discussions. And, um, and so, and so I, um, and, and when we're talking about one last point, when we're talking about border patrols, it's always for the people who are displaced by these very actions of the, of these, this convergence of, of corporations, war armies, 
you know, you name it, that that cause massive displacement, whether it be direct displacement or or the the you know emission greenhouse gas emissions through the the ravages of climate change, and and so and so those the, that is not discussed when you when you dis, when you when you discuss open borders. It's always like the person that's dispossessed, the person that's displaced, the person that's arriving to a border because maybe of desperation and that's and and i think that i think there's a, a really good reframing of the of the these arguments that that need to be had um and then i i would then just you know uh underscore what harsh has said about moving towards a more no border policy which i think is an is as as harsh mentioned imagining a new world and that's where we need to be Thanks, Todd. Um, th thanks to you both for, for those answers. Um, I'm going to take those. There's so much there. I'm going to take those both for yes, um, <laughs> that y'all can imagine a open borders and I'll add slash no borders or yeah, open borders um, towards no borders world. Um, so thank you both. Um, you know, this is in, in, in some regards, at least a, a book event. I, I want to ask you a little bit about your books. Um, you know, to me, they both, your, your most recent books, they both um, seem so much like political interventions that they are so, you know, tightly and neatly executed um, that they're like almost like marking ground in, in some way. And, and I just want to ask a little bit about um, your approach to writing them or what it was that you sought out to accomplish or sought out to tell? What was the story that you wanted to tell as you were approaching and then writing writing your book? Um, and maybe, again, Arsha, we can start with, with you and Border and Rule. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, it's always a hard question to answer, but I appreciate hearing answers when anyone else has to answer it. <laughs> um, I think, for me, uh, writing Border and Rule was a a few things. One is, um, as someone who's primarily been an organizer, um, I really wanted to move away from the weight of having to constantly humanize people's individual stories, um, which, and you know, John, you and I have talked about this. Um, and you know, that's a reality, right? Because in the face of constant dehumanization, uh, making sure that people's stories are told respectfully and on their own terms is such a big part of this work, whether that's as a journalist or as an organizer and, you know, just that individual struggle. Um, but I just felt the weight of it <laughs> constantly. And, you know, as an organizer, you feel like you're playing whack-a-mole, right? Like you're fighting one deportation and then you're fighting another one and fighting another one. And of course, you know, it's systemic. Um, and writing really was one of the few ways to try to make sense of um, that everyday grinding violence, right? Of how to like take a moment to step back and situate all of these individual uh, stories, which are different. Um, and really, you know, people have different subjectivities. And so that's why for me, as I note in the book, it really was to move away from trying to romanticize or generalize uh, the individual experiences of migrants and refugees or displaced people um, or undocumented people, but to really shift the gaze onto the systems of power um, that are operating and also to do it in a way. So that was one piece. The other was um, to, to try to break through the methodological nationalism, which ironically is, you know, embedded in, in the left and even more so in immigration politics, right? Like you think that for, you know, an open border, no border crew, um, we would all just do better, you know, myself included about looking at how borders and bordering regimes travel. Um, and, you know, of course, a lot of us do, but I really wanted to, to add and lend my voice to, to thinking through borders um, and bordering regimes and the ways in which they travel um, and in which these structures are actually transnational and to build uh, a stronger internationalist lens on dismantling borders beyond just the kind of silos of, you know, what's happening in Europe or what's happening in Australia or what's happening in the U.S. or Canada. Um, so that for me um, was another point. Um, the third thing was looking at how borders multiply, like again, returning to this idea of the border is not just at the side of the border. Um, but really how borders are constantly internalized and increasingly outsourced. And here, of course, Todd, your book on empire borders, really forcing us to think about how the border is everywhere, right? 
Um, so getting us to move away from just the border wall, if you will, but what are the agreements that are being signed that are allowing borders to multiply? I, I still think that we're not thinking about that enough as border activists or, or you know, no border activists. And maybe the last thing that I'll say is um, actually to, to rethink to rethink the politics of migration, right? Because in the same way in which we have so deeply normalized, and of course abolitionists would call on us to challenge this, that you know police and prisons correlate with public safety, um, which of course it doesn't, um, they're carceral institutions. I think to a degree we've also deeply normalized and have a sense that borders correlate with movement. And they don't, right? Borders have nothing to do with movement. And as you pointed out, Todd, like these contradictions between who moves and who doesn't, how capital flows, how military might flows, um, like, and you know, even people, right? Like in some ways there's an, a mass immobility, quote unquote, migration crisis. But like never before, we have more people on the move than ever before. You know, luxury yachts, business class, Nexus Pass, um, you know, vacationing everywhere around the world, airplane travel. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the seeming contradictions of the borders being close to people, but open to money and military is not a contradiction. It's foundational to how borders work because borders are not actually about movement. They're actually about state power, capitalism and imperialism, which is precisely why they operate in differential ways on different people and on different systems. Um, and that's why I opened the book with a story about gentrification, <laughs> which seems completely irrelevant to bordering regimes. But I think thinking about bordering regimes rather than the border um, was something that I wanted to do as well so that it can, you know, it can weave um, and, and connect different systems of power. Because otherwise, I think we, we um, can often fall into the trap of thinking of the border as a symbolic site rather than a system of power and a regime that's operating alongside other systems of violence. Todd? Yeah. Um, so in Bill Bridges Not Walls, um, I start, I mean, pretty much the, the story comes out of how it's, how it starts and it starts with, uh, um, I'm, I'm, driving in a fairly isolated part of the Sonoran Desert, um, about 20 miles to the north of the U.S.-Mexico border, and a man appears at the side of the road. Um, uh, he is waving his arms in, in, in distress. So I stop, I stop the car, and I um, uh, give, end up giving him a bottle of water. Um, and he... Uh, then asked me for, I asked him if there's anything more I can do for, do for you. And then he asked me for a ride to the next town. And then, um, so when, when that question was asked, I just began to think about immediately, um, of the border control apparatus around me. And then, I mean, I started, I wondered like how far were these green striped border patrol vehicles? Were they near, nearby? I'm sure they are. We're 20 miles from the border. We're, um, and uh, and they're all around. Or was it was I being viewed from a, a high tech surveillance camera that you know that might have been even seven miles away? Was there a predator bee drone flying overhead that had me on camera? Did I go over uh, a motion sensor? You know, I started thinking about like those years of reporting on all of this. You know, this massive expansion, historic, dramatic fortification of the of this border apparatus. And um, so I'm thinking of that and why I'm hesitating to answer the question and that and then with that hesitation, there's a bit of then I become infuriated with myself because how can I hesitate, you know, in a certain in this sort of situation that's very, very basic. Right. There's and I know like when you when you look at the at the U.S. Mexico border, there's so many people crossing have 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 lost their lives crossing the border. And um, and these are the situations of daily every day. It's every day this is happening. Today, I'm sure it's happening here. It's 100 degrees. This is the time when people are going through the desert and they don't make it. There's it's impossible to bring enough water. So how could I possibly say no? You know, how how can I possibly say I'm not going to give you a ride? And um, and so you know, this the kind of essence of what the border is in that sense just became really, really sharp. You know, like anti just basically anti-kind, anti you know, anti 
what you would do, like the values that I learned is from a very young age, how to treat fellow human beings. Um, and then very anti-solidarity as well. The solidarity that, that to, to, to be with another person and, and to even like in thinking of some, to imagine another world. And, um, and it was basically that, that, that experience and the meditation of that, it just brought in this meditation that, that led to this book. And I took that and I, and I went, I took that experience and then I just wanted to interrogate the border, right? And I, and I just went and talked to you, talked and read many different things, including John and Harsha's work. Um, um, and, uh, but to also talked to you like different, you know, ranging from visionaries to philosophers, to politicians, to, to, um, to many pe migrants and refugees and, and, um, and, uh, and a whole ab abolitionist. I, I went deep into abolitionist thought, um, and and just came, you know, came up with this idea, you know, that the end all is and children. I should say children because children became a huge part of it. I don't want to forget that. And this idea of generations and really thinking in terms of generations. I have young ones myself, so now I'm forced constantly i'm on my state of mind is almost always thinking of their generation and th so thinking in generations like that and it the it's it comes very simply like this we get it's you got to get rid of this the, you know <laughs> i'm sorry to say it this bluntly but it's it's like this is there's no other you know conclusion to draw and 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 finally you know just to end with if you if for people that are interested in justice right ideas of justice racial justice economic justice climate justice for that to happen uh, the border system the borders and the border apparatus the bordering elements that our show is mentioning um is an impediment is a is an obstacle to that to, to for that to happen Thank you so much, Harsha and Todd. Um, just, yeah, I mean, so much to digest here. Um, I really, really appreciate everything y'all are sharing with us. Um, and uh, before we move on, I, I definitely have some more questions and we're gonna do some Q&A. Uh, you know, these last two answers were, you know, sort of framing their books, talking about their books. And I would like to say, well, thanks to City Lights and Haymarket, but you should buy these books. It really does, make a difference for the authors, for them to be able to continue to do this, for the publishing houses and for the bookstores who sell these books and who support this kind of thinking, this kind of radical approach to something like Borders. So just buy them. They're, they're, they're great. And as I said, I think I described them as um, scintillating and, and readable. And, and that's that's true. So. Um, Here's my my uh, second plug, and maybe not my last, for for purchasing these two books, um, and you know transitioning from there um, to discussing a little bit or asking you about language and narrative. You know, I I, I hear this come up already in in both of your answers um, so far tonight. You know, how important is the way that we're talking about this? You know, um, Todd, you were describing you know, the, this idea of being for open borders as this epithet, this negative epithet to describe people. Um, you know, I think there's, there's so much contradiction in the way that we talk about immigration. Um, you know, in the United States, at least, you know, we celebrate migrants in our national mythos. And yet in practice, in daily practice, we revile them so violently. And like, how do we square those two things? Like we're seemingly not telling a true story. And I kind of want to ask, and there's, there's, there's so many different examples. I know, Harsha, you and I have spoken about this before, about the way that you want to reframe border deaths as border killings. Um, or um, to go back to Todd again, like thinking about, you know, this idea of you questioning whether or not you're going to give a person who is thirsty and facing possible, maybe even probable death in the desert, you were forced to question whether or not you would give them aid. 
you know, I think that that is the radical stance. Like, a normal human stance would be to say, of course, yes, like, you're a fellow human being, here's some water and jump in my car. And yet that is, not only would that have been illegal, but it is deemed radical in some way. But I think the, the opposite really is radical. So any, anyways, uh, sort of a, a long-winded way of asking, like, you know, you all are such careful um, storytellers. And so how do you approach um, sort of redefining the narrative around immigration? And, and what is that importance? Maybe we could start again with Harsha. Thanks, John. I thought you might shake it up there. <laughs> um, I, yeah, thank you for the, the question around, um, around language. Um, and yeah, I, I know we've chatted about it and, you know, and language is one of those things too, where of course it's, it's so deeply contextual and it depends who we're speaking to and in, in what room and, you know, who's present, et cetera. Um, but I think so much of this work is reframing and not in a way that's, you know, because language tells a story, because language is connected to our political imagination, because language is connected to, um, you know, how we express ideas and what we make of ideas and what we internalize and how we communicate it to the next generation. Um, but I'd say for me, um, there's so many parts <laughs> of language around this, um, and I don't even know if I could cover all of it, but, you know, even the invocation of a migrant crisis itself, you know, we know since 2015, at least, since the global migration crisis was officially declared, and, you know, variations of it, refugee crisis, migrant crisis, migration crisis, migrant invasion, border caravan, border crisis, etc. Um, all of that language um, has essentially served to securitize the border, right? And it's, it's done that work in a number of, of ways, um, which is that, you know, anytime crisis is invoked by the state, it allows the state to reconfigure its, its sense of self and reconfigure its power. Um, it also positions the state as the victim, <laughs> right? Because the migrant crisis suggests that the migrants are causing the crisis. Um, and so the state gets positioned as the victim. Um, the invocation of the migration crisis as new with Western countries kind of, again, positioned as its victims, is also deeply ironic and offensive because, you know, for four centuries, almost 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while four million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered all across the world and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved over 15 million Africans, right? So in this kind of invocation of a new crisis, colonialism and genocide and slavery and indentureship, are completely erased as continuities of violence that even make the migration crisis possible, right? Like there's that entire continuity that is removed. And so all of those are parts of why language is critical. Um, the passive language of, you know, of people dying at borders, like every year there's just these mounting statistics of border deaths. Um, and, you know, we become immune to it. And part of that uh, you know, there's many ways we become immune to it, right? We're desensitized, systemic racism, othering, xenophobia, all of these play into why we become immune to it. Um, if we are immune to it, I don't assume we all are. Um, but a big part of that is, of course, the passivity of it, right? When we talk about death in this passive way, as if though people just happen to die at the border, as if though um, border killings <laughs> are not an active are not an active form of violence being enacted, right? People don't just happen to die at the border. Lots of people cross borders without dying, um, without being killed. But as we know, some people are targeted. Some people um, die at borders because borders are intended to kill them. The entire state apparatus of prevention through deterrence requires killing because the deterrence is border killings, right? And this is in the United States, this is in Europe, this is in Australia, this is in India, all around the world. The doctrine of prevention through deterrence relies on, requires border deaths and border killings in order to deter people. And, you know, again, using that more active language, I think is necessary. Um, the last thing that I'd say uh, on language, and this is for me, uh, part of the work around reframing the migration crisis is the reality 
migration crisis suggests that people are on the move and able to be on the move. When the reality is, and you know, going back to your opening comments, John, the reality of the world is that most people are displaced and then immobilized, right? And that that's, a, I think, a far more accurate depiction of what's going on in the world. Because again, instead of just assuming migrants and refugees happen to be, if we talk about displacement, it forces us to ask the question, well, why are people being displaced? What are the forces that are displacing people, right? Is the crisis the migration, the migrant crisis or is the crisis capitalism? Is the crisis conquest? Is the crisis climate change? And so I think, you know, reframing it as a displacement crisis and a crisis of immobility, um, that language, I think, asks different questions of us. Um, it implicates us in a different web of power. It moves us from the narrative of generosity or benevolence or charity to responsibility, to reparations, right? To asking how, how is the state, the nation state, how is my government implicated in the displacement of those whom I consider to be others, right? Like, are they others or am I bound up in this violence in some, in some kind of way? Um, and so I think, you know, that's the way in which um, language becomes important because it reframes the migration crisis in a completely different way. It, it, it calls on us to ask different questions. Um, and, you know, again, without borders, we wouldn't even have migration, right? We would just have mobility. We'd be people on the move. Um, and so it, it forces us to interrogate even the border in a, in a completely different way. So I think language is, is so important um, in leading us at, to open up different windows and open up our imagination and interrogate our responsibilities in a, in a, in a deeply different way. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, uh, I think, um, um, I think the, the word border security needs to be banished. Just anytime you hear it, just, just throw it in the garbage because that's where it belongs. It really does. It's, it's, it's along the same lines. It's, it's a, you know, you, I've heard it so much, almost like hearing a mantra, and you, you just hear it over and over and over again until it becomes unquestioned. And then if you're to question it, and like in the United States, from a U.S. perspective, on either side of the political aisle, right, um, who, who you're, it's almost like, oh, you're against border security, uh, you know. We of course we're for border security. It's often you know often language is like oh of course I am for border security, but we should reform this this and this and this. There's it's it's often used, and I really think that that term needs to go, um, because if you look at it, if you start unpacking it, it's it's there's nothing about security. It goes right to what Harsha was saying. Not border. I mean border desk should be reframed framed as border killings. Right. The the um, the it's not definitely not security for people crossing the border. The prevention through deterrence doctrine forces people to be it's forced insecurity. So that's it's a it's the complete opposite. And then then you then you think, OK, what is it security for the people that live in the borderlands? Because I remember 20 years ago, that's what the Border Patrol would say. Oh, we're we're making things safe. And, and that's when they used to actually talk about prevention through deterrence when you'd interview them. They don't do that anymore. They don't even talk about this anymore. But they would used to they used to bring down, oh, the crime rates and and stuff like that. And and with all reality, like you talk to anyone in the borderlands, like near where I live, exa for example, and, and across a political spectrum, everyone hates the checkpoints. Like nobody likes the checkpoints. People feel insecure. People you get put in a secondary interrogation, you, you could get detained for a whole day or days. Um, the, the feeling of security is not what it is. So let's stop talking, calling it border security, unless unless you're to think, is this security for something else? Is this security for a bigger system, uh, much like much like what Harsha was describing? And then, then when if you think of it that way, like is security for, uh, you know, subjugation of people around the world because and the displacement that it causes then 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 it starts to make sense but that's the only way and um so so on that on the on that and i and i did want to like one of the 
like looking thinking about the last bit what of what Harsha mentioned as far as um, looking at um, the question of a displacement crisis versus a migrant, you know, a migrant crisis or border crisis, you know, that's another thing you hear constantly. It's repeated over and over again, which creates this one, you know, creates a certain set of questions like Harsha was mentioning. Then the displacement crisis, a displacement crisis, uh, an Im- immobilization crisis creates a whole other set of questions. And really, I want to bring that up because that was one of the things that really occurred to me at, in that situation with the man in the in the in the um in the desert because by the end of the book and i hate to give away an ending but i will <laughs> a little bit at least um i realize it's me that needs needs the help right i realize it's me that that probably needs to be helped to, to be oriented if i'm gonna if we're gonna think about a world and in the sort of certain set of questions different questions that harsha was mentioning that it's not just my benevolence of giving somebody a ride. It's me learning, like talking, learning, and being oriented to what a humane world is, a world of justice is, by hearing this man who had, in his case, he had been living in Guatemala, or he's from Guatemala, and he'd been in the border, he'd been in the desert for two days. Um, so why did he, why was he displaced to begin with? Did anything from my country, like any sort of pol- foreign policy from my country, have anything to do with it? And the answer, of course, you know, if you start to interrogate things honestly, then of course the answer is yes. And then, and then the questions of of what you know, you get the question, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Well, this, I think, this is what how you begin to do it, right? Like the border, the border bordering border apparatus is much bigger, and it and it really has to do with thinking about. Um, a, like, what is U.S. foreign policy, just to be simplified, and B, really, really, really underscoring global solidarity and the idea of working together in a cross-border fashion. Thank you both again. Um, actually, I want to bring, bring in one more quote. Um, this is from a recent article about, again, about Kamala Harris's visit to, to Guatemala. You know, in in thinking about I think ways to solve this, this problem. Um, one, besides open borders, there's a lots of other, or no borders, there's lots of other ways that people sort of think about, oh, well, maybe, you know, we can help people stay at home by offering aid. Um, and, and this is, um, uh, this, here, I'll, I'll quote this um, recent New York Times article. So here in Guatemala, to reference, you know, you're the, the man that you encountered, Todd, which has received more than 1.6 billion in American aid over the last decade. Poverty rates have risen. Malnutrition has become a national crisis. Corruption is unbridled and the country is sending more unaccompanied children to the United States than anywhere else in the world. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, because, you know, people want often in responding to um, people who are displaced, do want to help. I think that people often want to react humanely. And I think maybe part of what you all do is break down the problems in relying on standard sort of status quo national reactions or reactions or responses that fall within the current border regime. And one of those responses is often, well, we can help this person. We can offer the, our benevolence or our charity or whatnot. Um, but as we see, and as I quote um, from the Times, uh, you know, I think makes very clear that doesn't solve the problem. Um, and I, I think one thing that's important to do here is is I'll get a little bit down to brass tacks. So you know, when people think of wanting to respond, they can do so, as, as I'm sort of saying, like, by just um, uh, just reacting or helping or trying to help in some way. But I think in, in, in many cases, that's because it's difficult to imagine the world that you are mentioning, Harsha, because we are stuck currently in the status quo, and we've been stuck in some form of it for a really long time. Todd, you sort of mentioned this in one of your previous answers of, you know, what would 
an open borders or no borders world look like? How would it function? You say, well, maybe a little bit like the United States, you know, crossing from one state to another. But I just, I would love to hear both of you, and we're getting some sort of questions about this in the chat, um, talk about what the vision of an open borders or no borders world would look like. How would it actually function? And, and yeah, maybe this time, Todd, yeah, we could start with you. Really? I was not expecting that, John. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it's I I was on a a panel recently, um, and it was about a, it was a climate adaptation. It was about climate adaptation, and it was a really interesting kind of a um, a conversation. But it was interesting because a lot of the same similar things that we were discussing um, here, you know, like colonial dispossession, for example, it was there. There was in discussion there, and then what. But towards the end, there was a lot of kind of conclusions being drawn, which, which were it was it was a it was a panel that was in the United you know based in the United States, and but the the conclusions were like the United States has to lead you know when we're when we're talking about climate and the climate crises and and the United States has to be a leader and there was a lot of talk about you know U.S. aid in terms of. Um, climate mitigate ad adaptation more than anything else, and um, and I thought, how could, you know, how could you have such a thorough knowledge of all these uh, all these different components of what's causing problems, but then the conclusion of the United States leading right is, you know, the for one, I mean, just the United States leading in climate as a histo as a historic number one emitter is is a bit of a a joke in a way but um but for two you know that's it's like framing you come to something but then you frame it you frame the solutions in this nations in through the the lens of nation states like the nation states are going to are going to um are 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 the ones that are going to solve these problems and that and that's absolutely not it's not going to happen right the the that's why i think the no border one of the big things about a no border like moving towards a no and the arc of a no border um vision is 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 uh really crucial it's not only to get rid of these borders in terms of you know the kind of the the brutalization of people that they cause but also that what Harsha mentioned, that reimagination of how the world is organized and the way that it's organized now, it's it, it's just not going to, like the climate crisis, there's no way. Like there's been 25, 28 years of this UN summit and there's as many emissions as there were 25 years ago, if you're gonna think of that way. So it's it's, it's like you have this, um, this whole, the whole thing, the way that there, there has to be moving towards a, a reimagination and i and for this i think arch is gonna have some really good answers here so i'm gonna cut myself off but um uh i really 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 turn to that abolitionist thinking um in terms of vision right and and just look at you know some when when you think of prison abolition like what ruth wilson gilmore often mentions is in that um that you know creating the condition so prisons aren't the quote unquote solution to the problem, right? So when you're 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 imagining the world where the the border would not be the solution to the problem, and that and then we get into this a uh, much more a world of justice, a world of um of um where you know the, the man at the side of the road he didn't have to like leave he has the right to stay right that the idea of like the conditions in your places that maybe i don't know why he was displaced to begin with maybe it was the climate crisis for all i know like many people in guatemala or it could be that there was some sort of extractive industry that that caused him to move in another place or poisoned his water, right? Or, or it could be like the historic ramifications of the United States, um, you know, supporting military dictatorships and funding uh, armies in, in Guatemala, um, or the fact that the United Fruit Company was given, you know, priority in 1954 and that corporate ol oligarchy still remains in place and that subjugation that Harsha just described so well. And so and so when you're like looking at that, 
the vision has to has to like it's got to be simultaneously a freedom of movement and a reckoning with these with these and you know these these problems to imagine a new world where all this stuff isn't happening and that's that's taking away um you know the the these power dynamics i guess but i'll leave it at that i've I've assumed that harsh is gonna really have a great answer here todd you had a great answer thank you um I would say, you know, in terms of that that question around, you know, how do we help in the nation states, and of course here squarely imperialist interests um, around aid, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I mean, appreciate the question. Also, it's it's not a new question, right? Like, how do we express international solidarity? Is really by building international solidarity that is internationalist, that is based on solidarity, that is not based on charity. Um, that squarely implicates, necessarily implicates imperialism. Um, we know that the answer to imperialism is not aid, um, which is not to say aid is not needed, but you know the ways in which aid is leveraged is actually to further imperialism. We know that that has been the history of Western aid is not, you know, it's not mutual aid. <laughs> it's not people to people aid. Uh, it's not the kind of aid, you know, um, that we think of, but it's aid that is leveraged to continue to maintain imperial powers. Um, you know, aid often as a condition that comes alongside a free trade agreement or aid that is attached to an extractive mining company or aid that is increasingly, and especially I think this is important, you know, in the EU, aid is increasingly tied to migration prevention campaigns. Like there is not a single aid agreement or trade agreement that countries in the EU or the EU as a whole have signed with countries in the Middle East or countries in the Sahel region of Africa that have not included migration prevention. And so actually, you know, when people want to help, aid is not only not the answer, it actually is exacerbating the problem, right? Because oftentimes aid comes with border militarization in some form, right? Border outsourcing in some form. Um, and so absolutely the answer uh, around, you know, without being too prescriptive really is, and I know this is vague, but it's international solidarity. And I think one of the examples of which there are many, but um, particularly in the, the Central American context that is instructive is the, the sanctuary movement of the 1980s in the United States, right? Where the sanctuary movement really had an anti-imperialist analysis where the, where the sanctuary movement to support refugees and undocumented people and offer sanctuary and religious spaces to think about sanctuary um, expansively as a welcoming was entirely contingent on and part and parcel of an anti-imperialist movement that also fought U.S. foreign policy in Guatemala, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, right, in Mexico, etc. Um, and so I think that is that is the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist orientation of migrant justice struggles, which is to say, the w part of the way that we offer support is to demand an end to the imperialist, extractive, exploitative policies of our governments. Um, and that that is, you know, how we support and that we actually see through the facade of aid, which is, you know, in the case of, for example, Guatemala and Honduras, we know in the recent decades has been entirely to prop up U.S. supported narco states, right? And narco governments uh, and coups and more. And so, um, again, you know, echoing what Todd said, that part of the fight is to ensure that people are able to move with dignity and to do so not from a place of charity or benevolence, but really understanding migration as a form of reparations, right? Migration as a form of reparations to imperial powers and imperialist policies. And so I think that's, um, that's critical. And I think one of the other things, this may seem offside, but I think it's, it's so important to understanding how borders work, um, is also understanding how uh, one of the ways in which we support, if we want to think about international solidarity, especially its relationship to imperialism and capitalism, is how insourcing and outsourcing of labor are two sides of the same coin. So, you know, part of the struggle is dismantling sweatshops and export processing zones and extractive free trade agreements wherever, you know, our governments, you know, our very loose, you know, we know that our governments aren't really our governments, but um, where governments, you know, Western imperial governments and other countries and other governments are um, exporting and outsourcing labor. The flip side of that is insourced labor. And increasingly, migrant workers are the, the human side, the human face of neoliberal globalization, right? 
And when we think that shutting down borders is going to somehow resolve the contradictions of neoliberal globalization, it, it won't. Because it's cheap in labor. It serves to ensure that workers are now stratified not only across race and gender and sexuality and ability and more, but now also stratified across citizenship. And so when we want to think about solidarity, part of that is also ensuring that we're calling for things like status for all people, right? Status for all undocumented people, status for all migrant workers, permanent residency upon arrival, like those kinds of concrete solutions alongside fighting um, policies of imperialism, war and extraction are things that we can concretely do in our communities um, that really supports people, right? Supports people from, you know, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, et cetera. And of course, much broader than that, but in the, in the example that you gave, um, that would be the answer. And of course, there's something deeply perverse, as we know, about, you know, um, representatives of the U.S. government saying we help people by making sure they stay there. And that was, in fact, the exact same claim that Bill Clinton made about NAFTA, right? The claim that he made about NAFTA is that this will mitigate migration. This will mitigate illegal immigration uh, because now Mexicans will have a better life because of NAFTA. And of course, all of this is smoke and mirrors and is bullshit, right? And we know that because they started building the wall at the same time. And so I think there's something... Um, deeply perverse about the fact that state officials are saying that they are in the position to support people um, when in fact what they're doing is just you know prevention through deterrence right like that's that's essentially what they're doing and so i think the alternative to that really is internationalist solidarity um, that sees an anti-imperialist movement alongside a migrant justice movement and as as connected to each other thanks thanks arsha thanks to you both um Okay, so, you know, I, I want to move to questions, but I want to ask one more um, brief question myself, um, especially in thinking about international solidarity or migrant justice movements. What, what, what steps can people take? Like, let's say we're on board. Okay, good. Yes, I see that vision, or I'm starting to see that vision, and I want to live in that world. How do we get there? Um, you know, I, 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 I'd love like a practical, if you could offer a practical piece of advice that people can, you know, take today or tomorrow or soon, you know, um, and then uh, I'd, I'd love to turn to, to the chat and, and get some of the, the audience questions. Um, maybe back to Harsha. Sure. <laughs> um, the practical advice, I mean, ooh, uh, maybe assuming that folks are um, coming to this and are getting on board or involved in, you know, other community organizations or movements or doing this work in different ways, maybe the practical advice I could offer is that, you know, no matter what struggle you're involved in, um, that struggle will intersect with migrant justice in some way. If you are an anti-war organizer, migrants are the, often the human face of war and imperialism. If you are an organizer for racial justice, uh, that, you know, working to abolish borders, working uh, in solidarity with migrants is necessarily part of anti-racist struggle. If you're involved in feminist struggle, um, you know, then absolutely migrant justice work is about dismantling borders because borders are sexualized violence and our sexual violence, detention centers are sexual violence. If you're involved in economic justice work, if you're an anti-capitalist, then absolutely, you know, again, there's a connection to migrant justice. And so um, I don't think for me, the practical advice is it doesn't mean everybody has to, you know, the way that we join the fight to dismantle borders is to do the work that you're doing. Uh, because again, the border is at the nexus of many struggles. It's just about understanding how all of these systems are connected. And that, you know, we dismantle one system by dismantling all of them. And we dismantle all systems by dismantling one of them, that they work through each other. Um, and so I think the advice is, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming. Perhaps I'm making assumptions here, but um, it can be overwhelming to think about like, oh, my God, there's one more thing that's fucked. <laughs> what am I supposed to do about it? Sorry, I'm swearing, but I'm not really sorry. Um, but, you know, and part of that is like, yeah, the system is fucked. And the more that we see it, the more that we're able to, to bring light to it. Um, maybe there's something less overwhelming about it because we start to see the synergies. We start to see the ways in which they're constituted through each other. We start to see the ways in which systems are built through similar ideas and similar ideologies. 
Um, and so I think, you know, if folks are new to this, it's just, you know, to continue to think about the ways in which this intersects with your own your own work, your own struggle, your own movements, uh, and the work that you're doing, because there's absolutely a connection. And certainly, you know, if you follow the money, um, as you know, Todd and John, you both have done, and many others have done, you'll see that, right? You'll see that some of the systems, um, literally they're the same corporations that are getting money to do the same work, whether it's, you know, whether it's Elbit in Israel, uh, that's building the, the apartheid wall in Palestine, or it's doing that work at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so it's, it's just about finding those connections, I think. I mean, I really think Harsha's answer was very good, so I don't know if I have much to add. But I, I do know from my own experience that, you know, there's there's just so many so many um, w big and small ways um, to to go go about, you know, getting involved. Where I live on the border, there's so many opportunities to, like, uh, uh, connect with Mexican organizations and form sort of binational projects or, or, or even movements um we we have uh you know demonstrations right at the border wall and the binational demonstrations where people come from both sides of the border um you pass things through the bollards uh those sorts of things uh and it's there it's there to be had and it's desperately needed so so i, I i'll just that's all i have to say but i encourage people to go into that Thanks, Todd. And thanks, Harsha. And um, I, I can be, as the moderator, the cheese ball marketer, and say another way you could support the, you know, coming open borders is by buying these books. So buy Todd and Harsha's books. And um, so uh, I'd like to, I've, I've already sort of asked a couple of questions from the audience, but I want to um, now go to a couple of the ones that we haven't addressed yet. So. Um, this comes from Rishi Sugla, and the question is, how did boundaries or borders look different between indigenous nations compared to today? And, and what can we learn from that model? I know it's something that we've kind of touched on a little bit, but I just wonder whether or not, you know, borders existed before there were borders in, 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 in the, their modern guys. Um, if, if either of you want to jump on that one. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's impossible to think about borders outside of, again, the context of the nation state, right? Have people always demarcated where they lived? Yes. Um, have people, and you know, and that's often the slippage that happens, like, oh, you want no borders? That means you, like, don't want a fence around your house. And it's like, well, yeah, because private property is also a problem. Um, and borders and private property are, you know, again, conterminous here. Um, but, you know, again, the border is is not about um, people, and particularly here, of course, indigenous nations, um, being able to demarcate the territory that they use and live on and steward. Um, it is impossible to think about borders outside the context of the nation state. Um, in the same ways that, you know, oftentimes prison abolitionists are asked, like, oh, if we get away with, you know, if we do away with prisons, then what will you do with, you know, rapists, etc.? As if, though, prisons are the only form of accountability, right? Like, accountability is not the same as prisons. And for me, in the same way, stewardship of land um, and, you know, place-based recognition is not the same as a border. Those are two distinct concepts. Um, and you know, it's impossible, again, to think about them outside of the context of, of carceral systems and the nation state and racial capitalism. Um, so that's the first thing. I think it's important to squarely demarcate the difference between bordering regimes and borders and like, you know, boundaries and, and, and marking place, if you will. Um, and I think, you know, indigenous nations, they're different, they're diverse. I don't want to assume or even attempt to make a pan-indigenous uh, kind of response here. Um, but what I can offer is that, you know, there are many indigenous nations who absolutely have ways of governance um, that are rooted in place-based ideas and kinship. So, for example, in the Wet'suwet'en Nation, when you enter the nation, if you, if you follow free prior and informed consent protocols, you may be asked, in fact, you will likely be asked, like, where are you from? Why are you here? Are you part of government or industry? And how will your presence benefit my community or our nation? Um, and to me, you know, a lot of times I get asked, like, isn't that a checkpoint? Like, how come you went through that, but you have a problem with borders? And to me, it's completely the opposite. There's not an entire 
state apparatus enforcing that? And of course, people have a right to ask like, what is the terms of, of this, you know, what are the terms of engagement between people, right? Are you coming to harm or support my community? That, that's not the same as a border check. That's the same head. Um, and it's very legitimate for people to be asking that. And so, you know, I think of that as a way in which people are stewarding land, in which people are, are, are building and affirming place-based um, presence and place-based laws. Um, and also recognizing that many indigenous nations often have overlapping territories with each other, right? Harvesting, for example, in mutually shared territories. Um, and so I think all of those are, uh, are examples. And again, you know, without romanticizing it or um, homogenizing it, uh, I think those are all examples. And really at the center of that is that we just cannot, we cannot assume that everything that is a form of accountability is the same as a bordering practice because bordering is fundamentally about power more so than about movement. Um, in the same way that we cannot say that any attempts to hold people accountable is carceral, right? Like they're, dif they're different things. And so um, I think those are just some of the ways. And again, you know, there's, there's many ways in which indigenous peoples have asserted their sovereignty um, that, that are, that are non-statist non-statist forms. Yeah, just a couple comments, you know, looking at how in the na in the nation state itself is, while when you look at those world maps, they seem like they've been here for thousands of years, right? They're very recent and their development was very recent. Even private, pro the idea of private property, like na the nation state comes out of the idea of private property. Um, and then in a European sense, and then it was exported in the colonial systems around the world. And so uh, that, and it, and it leads me to think um, of the Kenya-Tanzania border, um, where if you go to that border, it's almost you can see the difference between a no border and an open border politics, because you go to that border, there's absolutely nothing on it as far as as far as a uh, border apparatus like you'd see on the US Mexico border or many other places. Um, but interviewing people from the Maasai, the Maasai, um, the Maasai people there, the, the, the talk of the border, that border and how it was imposed and it was imposed by a colonial system. And when Kenya got its independence in the 1960s, that was the border that stayed. And it literally divided indigenous people in half, right? Like the Maasai were divided in half. So now, like people there call it the most egregious human rights violation just because it's there, right? And people, and they can't, and, and there's not like this ability to organize with like the Maasai who have same language, traditions, you know, same probably, you know, same same goals to organize now they have to organize in two different separate government entity entities and so that's because the nation state was imposed upon them as something actually new very new and as a system of control like harsha was mentioning so that's all i want to say thanks you both um i think we can squeeze in maybe two more questions um this comes from max Thornton, and he says, first, thank you for this great discussion. How should we think about COVID-related travel restrictions in relation to the need for open borders and free movement? And if either of you want to uh, quickly answer this one. Do you want me? I can go first, I guess. Um, Thanks, Todd. Um, I think, like, COVID, the COVID travel restrictions, they're... You know, um, I mean, I think COVID really to look at it in one way is is just uh, an example, like a global pandemic of why these closed border systems do not work. Right. Um, in the sense that, uh, you know, like co COVID uh, it, by its nature the fact, the fact that it's spread all over the world is it, it needs a, a global response to it and and to like put the response into individual nation states that's why you have this whole situation with the united states becoming well vaccinated but at the same time many other countries lacking in vaccinations and the kind of travel restrictions i think you, you have the same similarities of 
differences of context that Harsha was just mentioning that are similar to like a, a checkpoint versus going into an indigenous community and 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 um, uh, being asked questions about why your presence there um, in the sense. I remember just one little quick story. The same day that Title 42 announcement was made for the U.S.-Mexico border um, was like Mar end of March of 2020. On that same day, a whole plane load of people came from a cruise ship. All of them were infected with COVID. They landed at the Atlanta airport. So we're hearing about, on the news, we're hearing about how the U.S.-Mexico border is closed, completely closed, COVID, 2,000 miles, right? And then at the same time, the people got off this plane, went to the Atlanta airport, and then just spread across the country. And to me, that that, that story just says it all. When you're thinking of COVID or or a pandemic, it became it's quite apparent that quarantining and isolating yourself, if you have it, is super important. But that's completely different from a from a bordering regime that shuts off the border, that puts like draconian policies in place that and and i can tell you i've been back and forth across the the um u.s mexico mexico border several times myself so the idea that it's closed is not as a lie it's closed to people who are coming to the border who are undocumented or asylum, seeking asylum that is who it is closed to and the title 42 which is rapid expulsions that's still in effect um and that who knows when that's going to end it still isn't ended yet right and and so it's it's just they're they're just two different things and then the one last thing i just want to mention is to reiterate what i said at the beginning like the pandemic covid response it needs international solidarity to go back to that it needs people's coming together from all over the world to solve it and it's and it's much like i i can't like disassociate it from the climate crisis and uh think well this is also, the climate crisis needs the world to be coming together in the solidarity, coming together in those sorts of ways to be able to have a solution to it, um, rather than this kind of, you know, partitioning through asymmet asymmetrical power, you know, with nation states and and just like the hoard, like which is such an example of the hoarding of vaccines. But uh, I'll leave it at that and let Harsha talk. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'll piggyback off, off of where you ended, which is, you know, vaccine apartheid. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we would be remiss in, in not naming that in the context of how bordering regimes work to maintain global apartheid, which is, you know, already this ongoing displacement, immobility, imperialist, capitalist crisis. And now on top of that, you know, we have vaccine apartheid. And I know that, you know, for many People like myself who who uh, live in many well I don't live in many places I live in one place but whose heart is in many places it's it's deeply terrifying um, to sit with the comfort of being vaccinated and you know conversations about opening up again when the majority of the world is a deathscape and you know people that you know and love uh, are dying constantly um, from COVID and borders are one of the key pillars that is upholding this form of apartheid. And now on top of that, we're adding vaccine passports um, to that, right? And, and that really is what this pandemic has meant. We know this pandemic can, in many ways has just revealed the fault lines and exacerbated them where they already were. Um, and when it comes to the border, that's certainly, that's certainly true in the form of um, vaccine apartheid and vaccine passports that are being contemplated. Um, it's certainly true in the fact that, as Todd mentioned, borders are being shut down, but again, in selective ways. Um, literally dozens and dozens of states at different times in the past year have shut down their borders to migrants and refugees, despite there being no WHO directive to do so, right? And I know the WHO is, is problematic in itself, but it's important to say that, you know, this conflation, again, between COVID transmission and migrants and refugees is a deeply troubling one. And it's, you know, again, this invocation of the crisis has meant that borders have become securitized and where people have been killed, right? Where literally in the Mediterranean, trawlers and ships have been left um, and people have been left to die. Um, the thing here is that, um, you know, again, I think the last thing that I'll say, I took some notes, so I go fast, is again this contradiction, right? So the border is is open to some people. All the scandals of politicians traveling when there's stay-at-home orders, 
um, you know, luxury travel, cruises still docking, etc. While the essential movement of refugees and asylum seekers and undocumented people is blocked almost universally around the world. Um, and here the flip side of that is, of course, that, you know, while flights coming in or people are unable to come in, very few people fly, a lot of people are on foot. At the same time, deportation flights are still expelling people out, right? And we know that in the early days of, of the pandemic last year, nearly 20% of all reported cases of COVID in Guatemala originated from the United States. Um, so while people can't come in, um, deportation flights are still expelling people out um, and often people who have tested positive for COVID. And the other side to that is, you know, certain flights are able to come in, not just luxury travel, including luxury travel, but here critically, um, migrant workers who are maintaining our food supply chains, right? So again, if you are cheapened labor that can be exploited by the state and capital, um, then you are, you're welcome, right? Then, then the border remains porous to you. And we know that migrant workers continue to have incredibly high rates of COVID death because, of course, you know, capitalist interests do not want them to quarantine, continue to, to enforce incredibly dangerous cramped conditions of work that allows millionaires and billionaires to continue to accrue capital. So while the border is shut down to, to certain migrants and refugees and undocumented people, uh, you know, migrant worker visas are being churned out and deportation flights are still continuing to expel people out. And in that way, you know, the pandemic has has revealed what we know to already be a central function of, of the border, which is that it's selective, you know, selectively porous for some people. Thanks, you both. I, I'd also add, I've done quite a bit of reporting on um, COVID handling, COVID mishandling in detention centers. You know, part of the border regime is maintaining and enforcing it within the interior of the country too. And we've seen that the detention centers, uh, immigration and ICE enforcement detention centers became basically petri dishes for the virus and actually spread it rapidly. You know, there was a report last fall that there was 250,000 extra cases in the counties surrounding the detention centers. And then within them, people had no capacity at all to socially distance. They were threatened with being exposed by guards to COVID um, when they had symptoms they were ignored or not believed, they weren't given masks. I mean, that is part of the border enforcement regime. That is part of locking down borders is actually imperiling the health, not only of the people who are being detained, but then the people who are working in those detention centers because there's often no other jobs and then the people surrounding in the surrounding areas. So um, just wanted to add that one extra sort of horrifying bit and turn to hopefully maybe what will be a little bit more of an uplifting last quick question. This is from, oh, also a, a shout out to Jared who says hello to Todd and uh, me here. And um, then this last question is from Nineb Nursi. And it is, as the language of abolition reaches a wider audience and imperial powers continue to exercise increasing violence, do you think we're reaching a turning point? Are we public consciousness regarding borders? So, um, Again, uh, I'll let, I, I guess whoever wants to, to answer first um, jump in. Uh, are we reaching a turning point about borders? Um, I'd say in some ways yes, in some ways no. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> That's my short answer. I think in some ways yes, because I think people are increasingly, um, as you note, uh, thinking about various systems of power critically, thinking beyond the scope of reform, uh, thinking to, you know, root causes and revolutionary transformation um, that's needed. So in that sense, yes, uh, you know, abolish ICE, abolish borders, abolish prisons, abolish cops, etc. Um, so I think that has certainly picked up. I think um, there's some still parts of the left that hold on to the border, um, particularly when it comes to Kenneth Keynesian social democratic movements who believe that the border will protect against neoliberal capital, who believe that the border um, will will fix against capital flows. Um, and in brief, I would just say that's a misreading um, of the role that borders play. I'd say borders are a spatial fix for a capital. Um, and in that sense, borders will not protect against neoliberal capitalist globalization. And so in, in those sectors of, of the left, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, to really 
think through and question the role of the borders and how it actually weakens, not strengthens um, international solidarity. Uh, yeah, I I just, I, since this is probably the, one of the last thing, I guess we're ending now, um, I wanted to bring up an image that I, I see on the, on the border right near Sasa Bay, south of where I am. And um, in Sasa Bay, for it's a it's an area where where the where Donald Trump was building. He's desperately trying to finish the wall at the end of his term. In fact, you can go like miles and miles and miles down the bo the border wall road. Of course, there's a road that goes along it, and you'll see 113. Like January 13th was the the last uh, the last day of building this 30 foot. Wall, high wall and I and when I was I, I recently went down that entire stretch and 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 as we went down the stretch to the left where was the the discarded remnants of the previous border wall and um and that that previous border wall was the border wall that Joe Senator Joe Biden voted for um Senator Hillary Clinton voted for Senator Barack Obama voted for um in 2006 in the secure fence act and it was more of a 15 foot foot wall um and so as i was driving i saw that you know i just kept look i kept looking at the big wall but then i kept looking at the discarded other wall like this the the wall that of course of course it was replaced but but i but um i kept looking at that at the discarded wall and thinking damn you know that's how easy it is for this to just be removed right Obviously, they didn't remove it. They replaced it with another thing. But it, it can, it's just, it was just like discarded bollards just on the, in piles, just sitting on the ground, probably causing a problem in that sense. But, but, uh, but it just shows that, like, how, um, you know, how easy it could be. Like, that could be done to the 30 foot wall. And then that could be done to, um, to, like, you know, obviously it's m way more than the wall and just just like thinking about transforming this thing from one thing into another thing from from uh like and and it's and it could be that easy and i i think i want to leave it at that i mean i think harcha answered the question really well but it's it really is that easy you know if if to um say this let's discard this thing we don't even have to like think Oh, we have to replace it with something else. That whole idea of replacing this thing with something else is not necessary. Just get rid of it, right? Let's throw it in and throw it. Like, why don't we melt down the bollards and make it into something else? Like the gun, you know, the art, the artist who melted down the guns and turned it into sculpt other types of sculptures. That you know, that those sorts of like leaps of imagination. I think um, this idea that this border thing has to be there is not. It's not true. It does not have to be there. In fact, it it needs to go. If if there's any hope going forward, we we have to go. And hopefully, I think you know. Just the last word. You know, there are people are catching up to this idea, though. I I, I you know, and I hopefully that keeps you know there there's momentum there, and um, we can see some pretty nice changes in the next coming years. Well, um, two, two takeaways, at least from tonight, is you can throw away the concept of border security and you can throw away the wall. So um, we can do both of those things. Um, I'd really like to thank you both, Harsha and Todd, for your time and your thoughts today. I, I, I personally learn a lot every time we speak, and um, I, I hope that everyone who tuned in... Um, you know, also appreciates your your time and your thinking on on all of this. So, um, thanks also to City Lights and Haymarket and Verso and and to all of y'all who have been with us for the last hour and a half. Bye, y'all. <laughs>